One of the great joys that I find in art and creativity is that, as some may say, it helps to push the boundaries of culture and experience. Though I've never really liked that phrase, pushing the boundaries, as it implies set rules and implicitly a fear of punishment for testing, pushing, changing, or overcoming those preconceived boundaries. Through the varying mediums of art, different people, however, lend their voices and talents to not so much push boundaries as to widen our views, stretching how we consider art, the world, our own human experience, and even our faith. Creativity challenges us to re-examine, or perhaps examine in detail for the first time, things that we might have always taken for granted. We are invited to suspend the world that we know for the reality of what could be. In 2017, the scholar David Bentley Hart used his talents to publish a new translation of the New Testament, one which I have been using here at Faith for our Gospel readings since the beginning of the season of Lent. The goal of his translation was to have the English words, as closely as he could, reflect the Greek. That includes awkward sentence structure and all. And this is so that we, as the reader, to quote Dr. Hart, could shake off the Prozac-like repetition of what we are used to hearing and instead hear what the scripture is saying. I would like to share Dr. Hart's translation of part of today's gospel. This is from the third chapter of John. It's verses 16 and 17. Dr. Hart translates it as such. For God so loved the cosmos as to give the Son, the only one, so that everyone having faith in him might not perish, but have the age of life. For God sent the Son into the cosmos, not that he might pass judgment on the cosmos, but that the cosmos might be saved through him. Did you hear that? For God so loved the cosmos. Some might say that the change between world that we are used to hearing and cosmos that heart uses is a minor one, but I disagree. And I say that because most people I know have said at some point in their lives, even if only in jest, that their entire world exists on their cell phones. I think this points to how small our concept of the world has become, that the entire world is merely the reality that we interact with via the thing in our pocket. And we as people are often too busy to consider much beyond that on a daily basis. Hart's translation here pushes us. It seeks to widen our views, to consider God's redemption for all of creation, beyond humanity, or even the world that we call Earth. To consider that the cosmos is being saved, to consider that to receive the life of the age, that the Son must be given, that is, to die, to sit in this moment. This moment wherein we find life in the murmuring echo of death. To consider the fear of letting go. Letting go of what we have known, releasing the life we have for the blessing of the life of the age, 
to enter into God's promised future, a journey that begins in our death. There is an Anglican parish in the English town of East Coker. Inside that church, you'll find a decorative oval, a hatchment, they call it. And within that hatchment are the ashes of renowned poet T.S. Eliot. There's a plaque on that hatchment, and on it, a quote from Eliot's Four Quartets, one that was inspired by Mary, the Queen of Scots. The quote is, In my beginning is my end. In my end is my beginning. For us as Christians, we know what this is all about. Our end is not just when we fall to the ground dead to be buried, but our end is our destiny, the end for which we are created as people of God. The reality that we are welcomed into in the waters of baptism, where our old selves are left dead to sin and swirling in the drain. In my end is my beginning, and my beginning in my end. We proclaim and believe at baptism that being baptized like Christ, we too share in a special reality, that as we share in a death like His, we too shall share a resurrection like His. A resurrection to a new reality for us and all of creation, that is to say, the cosmos. Walking into death with Christ is actually walking into Christ's beginning for us. That journey, a journey not of ending, but of truly beginning, for in Christ there is a new creation, and in our end we find the welcome of Christ into God's new creation. We can find stories similar to this in the Old Testament. For example, the story of Moses, the Israelites, and the poisonous snakes in the 21st chapter of Numbers. Poisonous snakes bite the Israelites, who are in turn afraid of death. Then, following God's command, they make a bronze serpent and look upon the image of their inflictor and by the power of God, they are healed. By the power of God, that which was to be their end, the serpent, becomes another thing the Israelites, these people of faith, travel through, standing changed on the other side because of what God has done. We can also see this reflected in the reality of the book of Revelation. Amongst the apocalyptic images, there is a confidence that John the seer walks with as a person of faith, looking straight into the end of time, describing it for us, and coming through the other side because of the power and reality of faith on his life, because of what God has done and is doing for him. When we were born, our whole biography as children of God was already there. In that beginning was our destiny. Now, what we do with the time in between, that, that is the big question. T.S. Eliot wrote of people who were distracted from distraction by distraction. This is as true as ever for us today. How many of us have gotten done with work only to turn on the TV 
a distraction in order to help us lose focus from the world inside of our phones or on the computer, which are other distractions. These distractions steal our attention away from the reality that we are a species that live in time with an indestructible hunch that we are made for eternity. This is the great riddle of life, feeling and believing that we are made for so much more than a mere sequence. We are more than mere ashes. And yet, as Eliot would identify, that time is a condition of our salvation. For in our end is our beginning in God's new world, God's perfect cosmos, God's reality far beyond our existence. The riddle is, how do we find life while staring at death? How is an end a beginning? And the answer is easier to hear than it is to understand. It's because of what God has done. Because God so loved the cosmos. Amen.